Okay, thinking about this. Um, so our next panel, uh, if y'all want to start moseying up, um, it is going to be talking about the practice side of things. How how culturally competent education can lead to innovative library programming, and this is really fun. Here we we have four folks, three of whom actually serve as mentors to IDP students on the panel, and one of whom is a recent graduate. So you've all met Michelle Hamiel earlier. Cindy Klebeck is the manager of the Southeast Anchor Branch of the Pratt System. Patrick Timoney is the assistive technology guru for DCPL. And Liz, oh, excuse me, Elizabeth DeCoster is a librarian at Goucher College. So. I'm a recent graduate from the University of Maryland College Parks High School. I graduated in 2011 in the Information and Diverse Populations concentration, but before they had the awesome cohort and mentoring that they do now. So I want to <laughs> highlight for the current students what an advantage that is, because what I'm talking about today is what I learned and how it applies to what I do. And part of what I'm going to be talking about is how important doing is. Like, you have to get out there and do it. Um, I currently serve as the user services librarian at Goucher College, which is right outside of Baltimore. And user services basically means it's kind of a fellowship position for a library that's not really large enough to support a floater librarian to go around and do stuff. So a large part of what I do is just anything that involves interacting with our users. I teach, I do the reference desk, I do access services and circulation, I supervise our student workers, I serve as a liaison to multiple departments and programs on campus. So. I get to do a little bit of everything, and that's hugely advantageous. The most important thing I learned about in the IDP program is the importance of partnerships. You have to be able to get out there and make connections, and you have to understand the difference between adapting services and developing services or programs or activities. Um, my position is new at Goucher College, the person who preceded me had a different job and a different set of job responsibilities. So I came in with a little bit of a blank slate. I had some opportunities to try some new things, but it also means that even though I was a new librarian, I didn't have a template to work from when I was, uh, when I was starting out. So the first thing and the most important thing and the thing I got the most support from my director about was just getting out there and trying to make connections, just showing up at meetings, at committees and activities getting introduced around and making my face uh, known on campus to, to people and especially to students. Uh, two of the groups I work with are PRISM, which is our LGBT student group. Um, so I've served on a number of panels for them. And part of what I say to them is, well, now you know who I am. So if you have a question and you don't feel comfortable coming up to someone that you don't know because maybe that question is related to research in gender and sexuality or research in non-conforming, you know now that I'm a friendly face and a friendly person in the library, please tell your friends. Um, another program I work with is the Equal Opportunity Program, which is for first generation college students who come from, who have strong academic backgrounds, but maybe come from schools that don't quite meet the curriculum requirements for Goucher's very competitive admissions program. So they do a summer bridge program where they come in and they get the chance to get a little bit of one-on-one -on -one attention to help make sure that they are ready for English 104 and the introductory level classes. So we teach a special instruction session for these students over the summer to let them know what the library offers if they come from a community that maybe doesn't have a strong public library or if they're one of those students of the many that we talked about today who maybe don't have a good school library background so they don't necessarily know what a library can offer. So we try and bridge that gap by getting ourselves familiar to them and making ourselves familiar with what their needs are. Sometimes it's about adapting your services. One of the groups I work with is the Goucher Prison Education Initiative, which is a new program this year to teach four credit Goucher classes in prisons in the Baltimore area. Um, so this allows incarcerated adults to get 
college education credits using actual Goucher professors, actual Goucher students participate. Um, but that presents some problems because as anyone who's worked in a prison system knows, if you check a book out and you send it to the Baltimore County prison system, they need a very long time to approve that to be sent in to whoever needs it. And we can't just get that back. So if someone else needs that book, we can't just call up the prison and say, oh, hi, um, we need that book back. So we needed to adapt our circulating services to allow additional time, duplicate copies, or things like that to make sure that we were able to serve both the students on campus and the students who were enrolled through the prison. Um, I've worked with the Disability Services Office and the Academic Center for Excellence, which is called ACE, which I think is an awesome acronym. And these, do, these offices provide support for a variety of students on campus with physical and cognitive disabilities or who need, I think it would generally be called like academic support, so students who have ADD or ADHD and maybe need different types of academic services. So we, they work individually with students to determine an individualized education plan, and then we try and figure out what we can do to support that. And occasionally it's about developing services we already have into something that's useful to a particular program. Um, one of the great programs that Goucher offers is the Futuro Latino Learning Center, which op offers adults opportunities to do ESL education through using Goucher professors again and student volunteers, and also provides programming for their kids. So they come in on a Saturday morning and the parents go off and do one set of activities. And the younger children come in and do another set of activities. And they need a lot of tutoring support. So we came up with a special reserves system uh, upon request from the FLLC to, um, to make sure that their student tutors could get the materials they need 24-7, uh, which is how often our library is open. So that's something that we were able to adapt a service, develop a service to support them. So this may look like a familiar acronym to everyone, ALA. Um, and this is really what I wanted to highlight when you're getting out there and you're trying to provide services, you need to ask. You need to say, what do you need? What can we do? And then you actually have to listen to the answer. It's not enough to just say, okay, well, what can we do? What would be helpful? Oh, great, I think I have this thing that I read about in grad school that might be super useful, but isn't actually what they needed. You need to actually listen to the, that information. Maybe take some time to synthesize that information. Don't be afraid to go back and say, um, you know, I need to think about that. I need to talk with my director. I need to talk with my coworkers and get a sense of what's realistic for us to tell you that we can do. Do we need to maybe find a place to get some extra money to do something like that? And that's one of the advantages of the library where I work. There's an extraordinary level of support, um, both mentally, emotionally, time-wise, as well as financially, for trying some new things through endowments and grants. Um, so a lot of times it's just about getting out there and saying, it's great to meet you, we'd love to help, the library's here for you, what can we do? And it's also about promoting what we already have that might be of use to people who don't know about it. Um, so the Academic Center for Excellence didn't know that we had a Kurzweil machine because that's usually promoted through our disability services office. So going to them and saying, hey, we have this, it might be of use for students who have like a cognitive processing disorder and aren't just low vision or have vision issues. So finding different ways to make those kinds of connections. Lest you think everything is sunny and roses in the land north of Baltimore, um, there are some places that I've noticed where there is room for growth. And I think it's important to admit that there's a lot of projects that are going to be ongoing when you're a librarian. As soon as you finish one project, there's going to be another project. Just because you've had one successful program doesn't mean you, need, you want to keep doing that same successful program over and over. You need to be able to grow and adapt as your community grows and adapts. Um, one thing that Goucher does do, because it's a small school, um, we provide very individualized services for students with disabilities. Another way of saying individualized is to say decentralized. Um, often students come in and they have a very specific set of needs, and we try and meet those needs and address them individually, but it means that we don't have a standard template that we're working with. As a new librarian and a new professional, that was extremely challenging for me last year to not know what we usually do. What do we, what do we usually do in this situation? I don't know. That was a response I got a lot, so I had to kind of make things up as I went along. And that worked out great, but it's important to be willing to try to do some new things. Um, 
We also have an issue someone was talking about earlier, and of course I'm spacing on it right now, with personnel. As the user services person, I'm, it's expected that I take care of most of the outreach issues, the one-on-one -on -one interaction issues, but it also means that if I'm not there, there may be an issue with students getting service. Um, especially because the library, as I said before, we're open 24-7, so there are issues where we don't have librarians there at 2 o'clock in the morning. It's student workers because we're sleeping, as I hope all of you are. Um, so there's librarians only there a limited number of hours per day, and so you run into issues where students maybe, whoever it is that's studying at 3 a.m. maybe needs to learn how to use a particular service that we have, and that may that may be a challenge if there's not a staff member there to help them out. So that's something that we're continuing to grapple with. We can provide the students with the service of being open 24 hours a day, which they love, by the way, but we can't always provide every service for them 24 hours a day. And so how do we find a way to communicate that information to get students to know when they can come in and get certain kinds of help? How do we train additional staff members to provide an additional, more, more robust, a wider range of services through a wider amount of time? Um, web accessibility. We do not control our whole website. This may be true. I know some libraries who are in the county system, the county is in charge of their website. They're like a subset of the county website. Uh, the library website at Goucher is a subset of the college website. So we don't, we only control the content. We don't necessarily control all of the format. So making it accessible in the way we would like to has been a challenge and it's something that we have to work on with IT, you know, with communications, there are branding issues that we want to be sensitive to. Um, and working with LibGuide, um, again, Goucher is a very individualized place, and part of the issue there is that the staff doesn't necessarily want to have a formal template of how things should look all the time. Every staff member wants to have the LibGuides that they get put together to be individual, which is great. I think it represents the librarians very well. It shows their personality to the students they can put pictures and colors and fonts and images, um, and I think it makes them, the research guides more accessible to the students in terms of interest, but it becomes a problem when you're talking about issues of contrast, font size, screen readers, things like that. Mm -hmm. So that is, again, an, an ongoing process. Um, we also experience problems with growth as the population of students who need disability services, additional student support services grows, that stretches our resources more thinly, both in terms of the actual space, we only have one Kurzweil machine, because we put it in a private room so that the students don't have the loud noise of the information commons disturbing them, but that means that there's only one spot, one seat for students to use that. Um, so as that population grows, as diverse populations at the college grow through recruitment and retention efforts, um, that's going to, that spreads us more thinly and we have to, as we said before, you have to get everyone on board with it so that everyone can be providing the same level of services. Um, so the last thing I wanted to say uh, to the students, currently enrolled students in the room, uh, the most important thing I can say is don't just be here to learn, be here to do. Because uh, when I got my job, it was great that I had taken X class and Y class and whatever, but what was really great was that I had volunteered with Patrick and with Chris at the Adaptive Services Department of the DC Public Library. I had taught instruction sessions in McKeldin, and that I really think is what got me my job, and I think being able to demonstrate that you're able to take these skills and apply them in a real and practical way is super important. We'll leave that up there. Well, Michelle's gonna speak next. Have a little housekeeping. You all who, have the um, who are in Paul's class know that I always say what I say here stays here. Well, see now the reason it has to, has to stay in the classroom is here. That's my director. So I need him to promise that whatever I say here will keep me in my library. <laughs> you want me to sign something? <laughs> um, that was a nice segue because what I wanted to talk about is um, the IDP students are so important. Um, when, even though there isn't much diversity in the program, the fact that you are embracing diversity is important because what tends to happen is we have older, and when I say older, in some cases, um, 
the staff in some libraries are 55 plus white women. And um, when you hit a certain age, and I'm in that age bracket, you are not always open to change. And when I first started at the Woodlawn Library, and just to tell you what that library is like, I am um, on the campus of a high school. It is a high school that has had a failing AYP for probably the last eight years. Um, there are lots of gangs in the school. Um, not necessarily a school people want to embrace. Well, all of those students in that school were coming into the library. So I get there, the majority of the staff were these older white women who were afraid because what they were hearing is from media that the students over there were killers. Not that any of them were, but that's what they believed. Um, so they don't want to interact with the students. And you would see um, at, you would say, 2 o'clock, all of our customers, older customers, were leaving the building, and we would also see some of our staff members trying to hide out in the back. <laughs> so that left me running around on the floor. Um, but we also had some other things happening in the branch. We had an older population in the morning. We had a computer illiterate population in the mornings. We had families in the afternoons. And we had to really become that salad that everyone's talked about so that we could serve all of our customers. And that's a reality for the public libraries. Um, thankfully, the library is now under control. Um, we don't have the people who are necessarily as afraid of the young men and women who come in after school. But now what we're beginning to see is the demographics are changing. Now, um, we don't have huge numbers of um, the Hispanic population using our library. And um, according to the census data, we have 5.8% 5. 5 of the population in the Woodlawn community is Hispanic. Now, we know that if it's 5.8% documented, it's a much larger population. And we only have one person on our staff who says she does not speak fluently, but she is able to speak Spanish. Um, she graduated from the IDP program. She came with an open mind. And thankfully, she came to Woodlawn. And she started saying, can we offer some programs in Spanish? Well, I was willing to do it, but I knew it wouldn't be me <laughs> doing the programs. And one of the things that we know is important is early literacy. Every library, every single library has it in their mission and vision statement that they are supporters of early literacy. They are supporters of lifelong learning. Now what's happening is the children of Spanish speaking parents are entering school but they aren't ready to learn. And there are no programs for them. And there are no library programs for them. And I'm happy to say that Woodlawn is offering fiestas and siestas, but it is because of Christine, who is willing to do programs every other Saturday in Spanish and English. The program started off, it was very slow, partly because I'm sure people didn't trust that we were going to have a decent program. Um, we had to do some grassroots marketing. We had to get on the ground and meet them where they were, in the markets in the area, in the uh, cleaners, in the laundromats, and making sure that they understood that this was a program that really was about them. That program has grown and that the numbers in attendance of those programs are just as large as our regular story times. There's an implication, though. If Christine leaves Woodlawn, who else does that program? We don't have very many Spanish speakers on staff. And um, the only thing that I can say is, and, and I know this is, this is kind of one of those things I say I worry about because Jim is sitting there, is one of the things that he wants is programs that are sustainable, 
He also wants programs that can be duplicated system-wide. Um, it's not su sustainable if I can't get another Spanish speaker in. Um, so what have I started doing? I've started learning Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> However, um, for now, and I'm dealing with the for now, because for now it is a program that is meeting a need of the community in the community that I serve. And I would not give it up unless, of course, they tell, tell me I have to. But <laughs> I would not give it up for anything because what it has done is now um, that community is beginning to use the library more. And we are beginning to build partnerships and relationships. We just recently had a Hispanic Heritage Fair. What it actually has done is made me feel so inadequate as a human being because when I have adults that come in and they are not able to speak English and I am communicating with the child because it is the child who speaks English, um, I don't have any signage in Spanish, I don't have any flyers in Spanish, I cannot communicate with the adults and it's the adults who need the service just as much if not more than the children. The other thing that um, I was open to, Christine said, well, why are we going to do this just for Spanish speakers? So we started seeking volunteers, and I'm happy to say that we've started offering story times in um, several languages. I think we've had a total of 13 different languages um, and offered. They're bilingual. Even I participated in an African oral storytelling session. Um, it was in part Gamala and English. Obviously, I'm the English speaker because I'm limited. <laughs> but in any case, um, so many people are beginning to come into our library, and it really does look like a salad many days in the library. Um, the other thing, and we, talk, we often talk about race, but I'm, I've touched on a little bit about it, my teen population. At 2 o'clock, every seat, and I think we have, we can seat, um, if we include the computer seating, we can seat about 120 people in the library. Every seat, starting at about between 2 and 3 o'clock, is full. Most of those teens do not want to come in and sit and read. But we have to have something for them to do, otherwise out of minds um, can be trouble. And many of the older people have either been transferred or um, they are retiring. And I've been uh, the recipient of some younger folk. And, and I, I don't mean to sound ageist, but um, when the kids said that they wanted to have a K-pop club, I had somebody on my staff who knew what that was. Um, I had to pretend, oh sure, I bet you can do that. <laughs> the, um, so we're offering a K-pop, and for those of you who don't know what that is, it's Korean pop culture. And who knew that a predominantly African-American community and I think everybody in the K-pop club is African American. A predominantly African American community um, were they were interested in K-pop, and they love it. The um, the other thing is that we decided that you know we need to get these kids up and moving, and so now they're taking a Zumba class, and boys are taking the Zumba class. <laughs> So we're offering some creative and some innovative programs. We're meeting them where they are. Last year we offered a totally different set of programming because that's what those teens wanted. We had boys who were knitting last year and um, we still have a teen knitting club. Um, the other thing that we realized the need that was not being met is we have a um, autistic population and um, Christine again uh, I think she might be the only one working at Woodlawn um, Christine wanted to because of IDP and Paul let me know that this was really because Christine had an interest when she was here at University of Maryland she wanted to do a story time for um, children with autism 
and it has become sensational story times, and it has become a regular that we offer at the Woodlawn Library. One of the nicest things that could have ever happened to me was that a customer wrote a letter, did not have a child in the program. What she said is that when her child was that age, there was nothing for him to attend and that um, a child who needed that kind of program, needed that type of socialization the most, um, wasn't able to attend the story time for fear that the other parents would not be accepting of his behavior. And she thanked us and then provided, I think the next time we had a story time, she came in and provided goodie bags for the kids in the program. We have had parents say thank you for getting these teens up and moving instead of sitting and eating junk all afternoon. Um, so many of the programs that are offered at Woodlawn are not offered anywhere else in the county and I was really worried about it because that always has system-wide implications where someone may say, well, why can't I get that at my branch? Um, and I worried a lot, but I know that I'm serving the community that I work in. Um, I can see the positive results. And the only thing that I can say is that when you graduate and you are interested in a library system, hopefully you'll get a manager who is open and receptive to new ideas, but don't give up. Make sure that you are putting your ideas out there. Make sure that someone is hearing you so that you can make a difference. You are closer to what um, change, the change that's necessary than many of the managers and directors are. And um, you can't just graduate and go into the system and um, accept the culture as it is. Make sure that you're make a di making a difference. You need to be that change. And hopefully I will have a job after I've said all of that. <laughs> <laughs> Southeast Anchor Library, which is in Baltimore City. Oh, thank you. I love being in the spotlight. I'm going to just stand here for 10 minutes and just let you watch. Um, I, start with this, I start with this slide simply to remind all of us that we are in a multilingual society now. So we have a bunch of different ways that you can say hello. So hello, everyone. Hello. Bonjour. Bonjour. Hola. That's all. That's the, my extent. Sorry. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of what we do. Um, my library is part of the Enoch Pratt Free Library System, which is in the city of Baltimore. Um, this is our founder. That's the lovely Enoch Pratt. Isn't he cute? Um, this is a very famous quote by him. My library shall be for all, rich and poor, without distinction of race or color, for when properly accredited can take out the books if they handle them carefully and return them. See, even in the late 1800s, they were worried about people returning their books. <laughs> um, and this is our mission. You may not be able to see all of it, but it's basically that we provide equal access to information and services that empower, enrich, and enhance the quality of life for all. This is my building in the happier springtime when there's flowers. Um, but uh, we opened in 2007, so we've been open a little bit more than five years. Uh, we were the first new library built in Baltimore City in over 35 years. So it was a big deal. Um, it's a huge two-story brick and glass modern industrial building. Can't really see it. I just showed you the pretty part. Um, but it is 27,000 square feet, and we are open six days a week. Um, we have 19 people that work in our building. Um, Eight of them are librarians. So the rest is CERC staff, janitorial staff, security. We also have a cafe. I know somebody earlier was talking about getting a, getting a latte and reading a book. Well, you can do that at my library. We have a cafe. Um, the eight librarians. The interesting thing is we haven't, we've been talking a lot about cultural differences and um, disabilities. 
I would like to point out that of the eight librarians that I have, three of them are men. Wow. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and the men in the back clap. <laughs> And, um, and I'm also very lucky that there is one on the adult team, one on the teen team, and one on the children's team. So they are spread out through the library, and they are awesome, every single one of them. Um, by circulation staff, um, we only have one page. Womp womp. That means everybody in our library shelves books. But it's an excellent way to learn your collection. <laughs> um, we do have a security officer, but she's super nice. Um, our language abilities. We have two staff, two and a quarter. I'm going to count myself as a quarter because, like Michelle, I am learning Spanish as well because it's necessary. It's necessary. I wish I had learned it when I was younger, but in high school I took Latin. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I have one, so I have two staff that speak Spanish. One who is a native speaker, who is um, the children's librarian. He's from Puerto Rico, and one who learns Spanish. She actually works in circulation, so it's really great to have somebody in CERC that does speak Spanish. And I have one staff who speaks Ukrainian. I just like to say that because I think it's kind of cool. <laughs> so, prior to, I'm going to tell you a little story. So five years ago when we opened, I was not the culturally competent person that you see standing before you. Um, we opened, and we knew that there was a large Spanish-speaking population in our community, and they, we wanted to try and reach them. Yes, you, you see where the story is going already, I know. Um, we opened in May, so somebody, and I must say, the person who suggested this to me was Latino. So I don't know if he was trying to lead me astray, but he was like, throw a Cinco de Mayo program. It'll be great. You'll get tons of people to come in. Just get some books. Get a piñata. You'll... Come now, the rafters. Yeah, well, no one came. No one came. So failure. <laughs> why? So why didn't they come? We weren't representing the target population's true culture. That's really an American holiday about drinking cerveza. It's not really. <laughs> and quite honestly, it's using a major stereotype, which is insulting. So bad us. Sorry. Um, so what did we learn from that? Don't just hang a pinata and expect Spanish speakers to come to your library. <laughs> I should have known that. I should have. Oh, she claps. I got a clap. <laughs> this is what my neighborhood looks like. In my neighborhood, the, the little red L, that's us, that's the library. All those S's are schools. There are 10 schools in our immediate community. Um, most of them elementary, middle. There's only um, two high schools. Um, the large green area that you can't really see, that's Patterson Park. We have um, two major medical systems in our neighborhood. Um, this green line right down the center of the slide, that's Eastern Avenue. That is the socioeconomic divide in my neighborhood. Those who live north of it, lower socioeconomic. Those who live south, higher. Um, we have a mix of ages. Everything from senior, you know, young professionals and, and people with young families to seniors. Um, and this is just a little bit of the ethnic populations in my neighborhood. Um, that green box that says BRC, that stands for the Baltimore Resettlement Center, which sits catty corner from my libraries. It is the nonprofit organization that helps to resettle refugees in the United States. This one resettles people in Baltimore. They resettle approximately 1,000 people in Baltimore every year. And the coolest thing about that is that is the reason that we have a lot of these different cultures in our neighborhood, but also the coolest thing, the thing I like best about it, is one of the first things they do when they bring new refugees in is they bring them across the street to get them a library card. Why do they do that? Well, number one, we're cool, of course, but number two, because that gives them access to all of the resources we have, but especially the free computers that we have so that they can communicate with their family and friends back home just to get information. I have a lot of people, I didn't realize that there were so many different Eritrean music videos and movies and TV until they started coming in and, and wanting us to be like, YouTube, put me on YouTube, I want to watch music videos. Okay. And they sit there using up their computer time. It's a little piece of home. The census data for our neighborhood. Now, remember, I said all of this. So this, these are all the different type. Well. The, his, the history of our community is that it's very white. 
Eastern European roots. So a lot of Greek, Italian, Polish, Ukrainian. So overwhelmingly, the census data still shows that we 59% white in our neighborhood. Um, the African American population is about 17%. We have a small Asian population. The one that I want to draw your attention to is the Latino population. I didn't, I took that slide out, but in the 10 years between the censuses, the Latino population in our community quadrupled. It went from about 4 or 5% to now it is 18.5%. And again, that's the documented on the census. So, okay, so five years ago, bad pinata, bad librarian. So in the five years, what have I learned? Um, you can't approach every customer the same way, and a lot of these are common sense, I know, so you just nod along, it's fine. Um, you meet the customer at their comfort level. Smile and listen. You can get really far with a nice smile and a, yes, yes, I, I want to help you. I'm listening to what you're saying. Um, don't judge a book by its cover. Don't stereotype. Learn from my mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's equal treatment, not the same treatment. Going back to you can't approach everybody the same way. Um, it's okay to make a mistake. Nobody's perfect. And it's never too late to learn a new language or about a new culture, which we do every single day. Um, my, my key is to build a good team of people. Clearly, I am of the white persuasion, so I am not diverse. Um, you want to build a team of people who genuinely like to work with people. If you don't like working with people, I'm sorry, you're in the wrong profession. You want, to have, you want to have people who want to have a desire to make a difference, um, who respect other people's backgrounds and cultures. I have had staff members who ask questions like, why do we do those services for those Latinos? And I was like, come here. Let's have a conversation about what you just said and why that's not appropriate. And I want people on my team that are invested in, in achieving our branch goals, which is access for everyone. Everyone to be comfortable, and to feel good about coming into the library to use our services. Um, but I will also say, having the right attitude will help bridge any gaps in skills and knowledge. I can teach you skills and knowledge, but if you're not coming in with the right attitude, we're going to lose right from the very beginning. How much time do I have? Am I over? No. OK. <sighs> talked really fast. Awesome. <laughs> um, so how do we do this? We do, we do a little bit of this. We offer, we explain what, what the library is, we have collections, we do programming, we do special events. I'm gonna go through these really quick. Um, the main thing is, is that a, a lot of you who, who work on the front lines know a lot of people who are coming from other nations don't have any idea about what a public library actually is. They have no concept of it from their own countries. So we get a lot of, am I allowed to come in here? How much does it cost? Do, are you sure I'm allowed? Yes, please, come in. Um, because the, the libraries are for the rich, or just for academics, so not usually for everyday people. Um, going back to Enoch's quote at the beginning, we do sometimes have to remember people because remind people to bring the books back because they confuse library and bookstore. Hmm. Um, we have a because we have, because twenty percent of our population is Spanish. We do have special collections for Spanish speakers. Um, it's a Spanish only and bilingual collection combined. So we have books, we've got magazines and newspapers, DVDs, we've got a large DVD collection. And we do have um, a bilingual children's collection. This is a picture of it from last year. It has um, doubled in size so much that we are having to shift the entire children's department to make more room for it, which is an awesome thing. I just want to talk about this one program. This is sort of our flagship program. It's Buena Casa Buena Brasa. It is the early literacy, sort of pre, um, not preschool, but baby story time that we do. Um, it's a weekly program, and it is run by um, the native Spanish speaker, um, children's librarian, whose name is Edwin. He's wonderful. Um, ages birth to three with a parent or caregiver. Basically, it's an hour long. The first half an hour is the structure part of the program, so it's um, rhymes, books, stories, movement, lots of songs and parachutes and bells and stuff. It's really fun. Um, and the second half is then social time. It's time for the parents and caregivers to talk, to talk to the librarian, to talk to each other. Um, it is bilingual in, in Spanish and English in order to, for the Spanish speaking families to come in so that they get sort of start learning English. And also we get a lot of English speaking families who come in who won? I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> I talk with my hands, I'm Italian. Um, just waking me up a little bit. I 
know you want some coffee, but I just woke you up. Um, and we do, and we have a lot of English-speaking families who want to come in who want their kids to learn Spanish. So it's both um, for that reason. This is a picture of, if you're in Baltimore next week and you want to stop by next Thursday at 11 a.m., um, we are having, we do annual Thanksgiving. Because the people who come to this program have really formed a community and they support and care for each other so much, they wanted to partake in this typical American holiday called Thanksgiving. And so we provide the traditional Thanksgiving pieces, the turkey, the mashed potatoes, the pumpkin pie, which a lot of them had never, had no concept of, and they bring dishes from their home countries. We do it every year. <coughs> Food is fantastic. If you're in town, stop by. Um, the problem, the program is wonderful, and we get an average of somewhere between 50 to 60 people per week. The problem with the program is that there's nothing after it. There is nothing that, that bridges the gap between three years old, preschool, and when, and when they go to school. But we're going to fix that. First, I just have to show these incredibly cute pictures of these kids doing baby Olympics from this summer. Aren't they adorable? So come back in um, 20, actually 2014 for baby Olympics part two. Um, yes. So we are going to do a bilingual preschool story time. We're starting it next year. Um, I hope to start it in February, March, when we um, when we have the right materials to support it, um, because the kids are aging out of Buena Casa, and so we want them to have somewhere else to go, something to keep keep their learning and keep their early literacy growing. So we're starting that. It, um, I don't know how it's going to go. I'll report back. Hopefully it'll go okay. But we do other programs. I show films in Spanish, foreign films, but we also show films with Spanish, in Spanish, with English subtitles. If you've never watched Gremlins in Spanish, it's hilarious. <laughs> um, and just our signature sort of outreach event that we do every year is we do an annual Latino fair called <coughs> Celebramos Comunidad Fere Latina. Um, culture, very much embracing the culture, information, and fun and interactivity all at the same time. Um, it works because Trusted Resources is partners. Um, it's a really fun atmosphere. We have a planning committee that includes people who are either Latino or who work with the Latino populations. And it's not a library event, but a community event. And it's super fun. It happens every May. Feel free to come. If you want to like to be a partner, have a table, I would love it. And then, just because I, I think it's so cool, this past May, we had um, a visit from a delegation of librarians from Columbia who were just the nicest people ever and who were just really interested in learning about what we do in libraries and telling us what they do in their libraries. And the, and the differences between them were amazing. Like they were like, you have an urban fiction collection just sitting out on the shelf, like where anybody can see it. Yes. <laughs> we would never be allowed to do that. It's like, wow, okay. Well, we'll walk away from that then if it's, <laughs> but they sat right down. We did a, we did a mini version of Buena Casa for them. They, they kicked off their feet, their shoes, sat right down, sang along. They sang a little La Raña Pequenita, Los Politos. They were, they were into it and they enjoyed it because it was fun and it wasn't the typical, here is our collection, here is this, here is some pamphlets for you to take. Now I'm like, sit down on the floor, we're going to sing a kid's song, you're going to love it, it's going to be super fun. <laughs> We also do a lot of outreach. Basically, if they ask us to come, we will go. If I have the staff available, we will go just to get the word out about who we are, where we are. A lot of people still don't know that that large brick building at the corner of Eastern and Conklin is a library, even though it says it on the outside of the building. They just walk right by, they don't even think about it. Knowing where we are, and just telling people about what we do, and talking to them about how can we partner. Uh, partnership is the big buzzword. How can we partner? What can we do? How can I help you? We do a lot of, we do all of these things, all of them. Um, so my last lesson is, uh, and just because I, I do work for the government technically and I do love a good acronym, um, so I came up with this one, PACE. So um, when working with diverse populations, you want to make sure you have patience, awareness, you communicate, you treat everyone equally, equality. So it's not a race. Pace yourself. <laughs> Thank you.
My name is Patrick Timoney. I'm the Adaptive Technology Librarian at um, the Martin Luther King Library. It's the main branch of the DC Public Library. And um, I guess what I can tell you about today is a few of our um, adaptive technology programs, which is mostly what I do. So uh, we started with an adaptive technology user group um, about eight years ago, or actually it's probably about six years ago, two years after I came to the library. And um, that's been really successful. We still do it two times a week. It's called the Saturday Technology Training Sessions. Um, our next program was, uh, and that the Saturday sessions brings together, um, at first we just mostly invited the vendors in, and it's, so you brought, by, uh, bring the sellers together with the people who use the technologies. And that theme is sort of carried over for all of our programs, where you get the buyers and the sellers together. Um, the next program, that um, we implemented at the library was called Accessibility DC. And um, a man named John Croston, who is a web accessibility specialist in the, for the US Army, came to us and said, you know, I'd like to have a monthly meetup um, that gets the web accessibility folks together to, to um, share strategies and that kind of thing. So uh, we, well, we first had a, um, an annual event, a, a 100 person um, Unconference at the library called Accessibility Camp DC, and then started that monthly meetup. Um, John and a, a guy named Jenison Assumption from Toronto have really pushed that uh, series of events so that we, I think it's held in 22 cities around the world now and um, internationally, and a, a lot in Canada, um, but also in, in Boston and Seattle. And um, at, the, at Seattle, they actually had it at the, at the um, main branch of the downtown uh, public library there. So that's been a really successful model. Um, it, again, it's a, it's a relatively high level discussion. Um, sometimes it's kind of hard to understand what they're talking about because it's a lot about uh, computer programming. So what we have tried to do is push it to be more open so that it's more understandable um, and more open to uh, to someone just walking in who, had, who doesn't know a lot about web accessibility. Um, and it, it, it has gravitated more towards being uh, a meetup for the people who get paid to do web accessibility, and that tends not to be the uh, adaptive technology users. So we tend to have more um, folks who, who uh, just go over code to, do, uh, to make sure that the code is accessible, and not as many people who are using adaptive technologies on a daily basis. So we started something called Tech Talk Tuesday, which is uh, a monthly meetup on Tuesday nights where uh, the vendors would come in and give hands-on training at first. Um, as of the last year or so, it's turned into an iOS training, hands-on, uh, you know, iOS, because iOS is very accessible to people who are blind. So um, that's been really successful. Um, Janice Rosen, who's sitting here at the um, table in the front, who's uh, DC Public Library's um, librarian uh, for the deaf and hard of hearing communities, um, started a Tech Talk Monday on the last Monday of the month, which is an iOS training talk all in American Sign Language. And she's had um, deaf-blind folks to come to that event, as well as um, uh, folks who are deaf or hard of hearing. And it's been really successful. I think she's had probably 14 or 15 people in there at once, at least. Um, so again, that's a monthly meetup. We also had a, but have a yearly event now called Techie Talk, which is um, focuses on the uh, autism and intellectual disability community. Um, and uh, again, it was iOS heavy, or we, we demonstrated the iPads at that because there are so many apps that um, uh, are accessible to uh, folks with cognitive issues and intellectual disabilities, um, but it was also an expo, so it was an opportunity for the vendors to come in and, and uh, meet the community. That was Techie Talk. Um, last year, we participated in something called DC Week, which is a week-long um, festival, tech festival, around the city that brings the developers or software developers together with the um, uh, government and nonprofit. So it's basically the people who know how to build stuff but don't know what to build get together with, with uh, the people who know exactly what to build but don't have the skills to build it. And that uh, we participated in that event 
with uh, something called the Accessibility Hackathon, which was an opportunity for the uh, AT users to get together and say, this is what we need built. And then the um, developers came in and said, well, this is what we think we can do, and we sort of planned stuff out. That resulted in um, our work with the University of Maryland, where, um, as Mega said earlier, um, we had five different projects that included assessments of the programs we already do, do at the library. It also included um, a 508 guide repository uh, to working um, in collaboration with the FCC, um, which is, I think, or is just, just in the process of being finished up now, actually, um, based on that work uh, at the University of Maryland last spring. And then um, we also, uh, there was also work on an app, a, a mobile accessible book generator app. So that hackathon resulted in lots of great things through the uh, work that we did, that the, uh, the students at the, uh, at the diversity um, class did with the, at the library last spring. Um, we, Another, yeah, and then one other thing that resulted out of that hackathon was a, um, and, and it's related to the 508 guide repository with FCC, was a 508 tech manual that um, the DC government is putting together uh, in uh, collaboration with SSB Bart Group, which is an accessibility consulting firm. So um, we're, we have an accessibility hackathon this year, which is going to be this weekend. So everyone's invited to come down. It's very um, loose and um, uh, it's going to go on all day tomorrow from 9.30 to 5.30. Uh, it's part of our Accessibility Accelerator series. Um, and the theme this fall has been really to get the maker community involved in libraries. And uh, maker community, for anyone who hasn't heard of that, is, uh, and I don't know why we shouldn't have heard of it, because it's worldwide, it's an international phenomenon of um, maker events. And that means people who like to make stuff, so it could be sewing stuff, it could be um, handcrafted goods, but it, it can also be building software and doing robotics and do, using 3D printers. Um, these, this mo movement is, uh, have their yearly events um, uh, sponsored a lot of times by Make Magazine um, that will be up to 10,000 people, which is I think the, is the worldwide event, but um, they're, they're a lot of fun and then they carry that on with a, uh, a hack space or a, Maker space um, that's sometimes sponsored by nonprofits and is a regular open space where people can go get together to make stuff. Um, it's really um, it's sort of on the <coughs> cutting edge of what libraries are all about. I think in, in as much as they are there to um, connect people so that the people can then um, take those the ideas and in, the innovations and produce produce things. Um, that happens all in a space, in a maker space. So a really interesting movement to us, and um, we've tried to get them involved in our series of programs that we had this fall, including um, the hackathon, which is tomorrow. We, we started this uh, with our accessibility camp. We brought a bunch of kids in and, um, uh, showed, and we had a sort of a computer programming workshop at, that, at the accessibility camp and also at um, our transition fair, which happened last week. So our idea there is how do you make computer programming and building stuff in general accessible to people so that, so that it's accessible to um, all different kinds of people, um, but also so that it's easy to learn for everyone. And we'll f uh, finish up this fall with, <coughs> with an event that have, had originally, originally been called a Mini Maker Unfair, but it turns out that that's too close to uh, a um, trademarked name already, so we had to change the name of the event to the Do-It-Yourself Fair, um, and we very quickly named it for people with and without disabilities, which is kind of awkward, but someone suggested last week that we should call it, we probably will call it next year moving forward, the Do-It-Yourself Fair for Universal Design. So um, that fair is again, just like the hackathon tomorrow, but on a much larger scale, um, and open and um, improvised sort of event where we're going to put about 50, uh, sort of a setup like this, with, but with about 50 tables, and the tables will be rectangular, and invite the maker community to come in and demonstrate stuff. So Fab Lab DC will be there to demonstrate 3D printing and uh, DC Robotics 
but I'm glad we'll be there to demonstrate the vibe. And whoever else in the community wants, um, it has very little support from the library. In other words, we, we are just using electricity and tables and that's it. So no extra parking and no um, uh, AV, none of the other stuff that we'd normally have to support. Um, uh, very improvised and hopefully the program will almost run itself. So that's uh, the Do Yourself Fair for Universal Design. And I, so, but I think, and so the guy <coughs> who is um, helping us run that event, his name is Phil Shapiro, and he's a librarian at the Tacoma Park, Maryland Public Library. Um, he's got a lot of great ideas. Uh, and he talks, he's a, really interested in education, so he talks a lot about the maker movement in schools. And I think he's mentioned that both in, I think it's Baltimore and Chicago, that a number of schools are um, being put up for sale. And he's wondering whether um, those schools will um, be re-enlivened, I guess, um, by the maker community. And his suggestion, and he thinks that the private side should get involved. Um, he mentioned uh, just in an interview I did with him last week that uh, George Lucas is, uh, uh, I think, selling his uh, movie company for a lot of money and has decided to dedicate all that money to education. So Phil's idea um, for how to use that kind of money is to sort of, um, to, you know, turn the maker movement into a more education-related thing. And I think that that would, uh, this event may be an opportunity to get people together around that kind of idea and but definitely will be an opportunity for to show how libraries can play a role in that kind of thing. Um, I want to make sure, oh, there's also um, an organization called Broadband Bridge in DC which uh, puts on discotheques and these are opportunities for folks in the community to learn how to build their own stuff um, as far as technical things. That, um, we were talking about SEPA earlier and um, what, you know, I, I, so I guess this is just a note, it isn't related to the last thing I was talking about, but um, I had written down that, uh, you know, mesh networks, uh, these days it's not hard for folks to build their own networks. Um, so that's something also that uh, being part of that maker fair is, is lessons in how to build networks, lessons in how to build computers, and how to reconfigure computers. Um, uh, using things like snap circuits and those kind of things. All right, so thank you. We have time to take a few questions. And unfortunately, um, our Twitter API is kind of, kind of slow, so thank you. I have a short question for Cindy. Uh, last time you mentioned you, you, uh, your library uh, to the film festival for the, um, your customer. And so I, you know, I feel exciting. I just want to share this idea with my supervisor. I, I work at the Montana County Public Library. Mm -hmm. And what they mentioned to me is uh, we, we used to purchase the, it's called the US, USA licensing mm -hmm. for uh, presenting the film, but due to the budget cost, so we can continue to buy that licensing anymore. So I want to know, uh, in your branch, how how do you or how did you overcome this problem? How can you, you know, be able to do that right now? Um. I am very lucky. We are experiencing budget cuts in Baltimore City, but one of the one of the things they did not cut is they actually bought a blanket license from Movie Licensing USA for four locations, and I'm lucky enough to have one of those. So as long as the movie I want to show is in is in the database, I can show it without paying any extra money. Um, I do know that they do sell individual single licenses. I think there are hundred dollars a film now. So they can be a little cost prohibitive for branches who don't have a blanket license who want to show films, but it's hundred dollars, so if you can if you can afford it, it, it that is an, another option. I'm just I'm just lucky. Mm -hmm. Question for us, Cindy and Michelle. Do you all collaborate with the school librarians and the schools that are nearby? How do we work with the school librarians? I like Michelle. We are not as successful with the school librarians as we are with other personnel in the school. Some school librarians we 
um, have good relationships with, but uh, we've had more success with the um, language instructors and principals or um, art teachers more than the school librarians. Unfortunately, a lot of the schools around us don't have librarians. So um, we partner with individual teachers, um, especially with ESL teachers. There's an ESL, uh, ESL teacher at the local elementary middle school that's right up the street from us who brings her kids every two weeks to the library. And um, sometimes we read to them, sometimes we don't, sometimes she just likes to read to them. She just likes to bring them to the library so that they have the option to check materials out and to take books home with them to enjoy. Um, the, the, in my individual librarian, so the head of my teen team and the head of my children's team, they do go out to the schools and let them know that we're there and that we're more than willing to have them bring classes to us or we will go to them and visit them in their classrooms. Um, they just have to let us know what they need and we'd be happy to provide it. Um, we haven't done as many school visits so far this year. I find that that actually ramps up more in the spring than it does in the fall. Usually in the spring, like, there's classes coming all the time. We haven't had as many so far yet. Okay, as a question for uh, Elizabeth, uh, you work at uh, Gautreau College, right? Mm -hmm. And um, in our class last semester, we learned, uh, you know, how to serve the autism, uh, uh, you know, the uh, customer. And also, we already, I did some research, and also the presenter also mentioned we have a sensory story time in uh, many public libraries right now already through the nationwide. That's what I understand. And I just wonder uh, if your college or university gets the uh, autism, uh, you know, uh, patients they grew up, you know, now we have a program over for the children, when they grew up, they, you know, they, 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 they successfully get into a college maybe. Do you have that kind of user in your, uh, you need to reach out in your uh, university and what kind of service you can provide for them? That's a, that's a good question. Um, I don't have specific numbers on how many students we have with various um, disabilities, whether cognitive or physical, because all that information is kept very confidential. Um, I can tell you through experiences that I've had that we do have some students in the school who I would, I would say require services that would indicate that they're on the autism spectrum. Um, and the things that we've done for them have, I, as I said before, um, the we have a text-to-speech software program um, that helps students who are both like low vision or vision impaired as well as who maybe have sensory processing issues um, including autism, Asperger's, things like that. Um, we provide that in a, there are almost no doors in my library, this is something you have to know. I don't have a door, I don't have four walls. Like I've got two and a half walls and a little glass divider um, and that's something that was designed intentionally to make the library space very open and adaptable for the students, and also to make, um, I think, to make the librarians more accessible. So one of the few rooms that we do have in the library with a door is where we have put this text-to-speech software so that students can close the door, they can turn on the pink noise machine, which drowns out outside noise, to limit the distractions of the very loud entryway to the library. So. That's one service that we can provide. Um, the Academic Center for Excellence, or ACE, they provide a lot of services dealing with, um, if they have to take a test and they require additional time, or maybe a test, a quiet testing facility separate from the general testing room electrical, they do provide that, and they'll occasionally refer those students to us for carols or other individualized study spaces. Um, so those are some of the services we provide, but as I said before, we try and do things on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So really what happens is this OSS or um, ACE will tell us, oh, we have a student who needs help with X, Y, Z, what can you do? If we don't have something ready, we'll try and see what we can come up with.
Okay, we have one more short talk before uh, coffee and snacks.